Hi, I'm Mike Trombley and welcome to the 8th Annual Western Massachusetts Baseball Hall of Fame Induction Ceremony presented by Westfield Bank. Each year, the Valley Blue Sox work with the Western Massachusetts Baseball Committee to host the Hall of Fame's annual induction banquet, which has become a staple of the Blue Sox and Pioneer Valley's calendar. The Western Massachusetts Baseball Hall of Fame was founded in 2014 with the aim of not only recognizing the best and brightest baseball figures in the region, but also to celebrate the area's long love affair with the game of baseball. For years, whether in McKenzie Stadium, Pynchon Park, or Park and Recreation Fields throughout the Valley, the residents of Western Massachusetts have played, supported, and facilitated the game of baseball. It's during this time that we not only induct a fresh new class into the Hall of Fame, but it also allows us to take the opportunity to bring the Western Massachusetts baseball community together under one roof. This year, we have replaced our in-person banquet with a video ceremony to still honor athletes and leaders who have significantly contributed to the history of baseball in our area. If you would like to learn more about the event or the Blue Sox organization, please visit valleybluesox.com. From myself and the rest of the Western Massachusetts Baseball Committee, we'd like to thank you for taking the time to watch this ceremony and celebrate the induction class of 2021. Now for tonight's host, Rich Tedemer. Thanks, Mike, and welcome to the 2021 Western Massachusetts Baseball Hall of Fame induction ceremony. We're very excited about this year. It's a chance to learn a lot about the history of Western Massachusetts baseball and some of the men who played in it and started in it for years and years ago. We start off with inductee number one. His name is Adonis Terry. He played in the major leagues for 14 seasons back in the late 19th century. To induct Adonis Terry, we have Dan Genovese. Dan was inducted into the Western Massachusetts Baseball Hall of Fame back in 2020 for his distinguished work as the founder of the Westfield Wheelmen and author of The Old Ball Ground, the chronological history of Westfield baseball. Dan will share a brief history of Adonis Terry, which can be found in his book about the history of baseball in Westfield. William H. Terry was born in Westfield in 1864 and as a young boy was described as having a natural ability as a ball player who developed a remarkable proficiency in the game. During Terry's youth in the 1870s, pitching overhand was prohibited. So he developed an effective sidearm delivery which would naturally curve the ball. In 1883, a Westfield newspaper noted that Terry would learn how to throw a curve from Herbert Nordstrom, a famed pitcher on a Westfield town team in the late 1870s. After graduating from Westfield schools, Terry left home to work in a Bridgeport, Connecticut factory and pitch in a semi-pro league. During his two years in Bridgeport, Terry's fame as a young pitcher sparked the interest of the owners of a new minor league team, the Brooklyn Grays, today's Los Angeles Dodgers. Against his parents' wishes, he signed his first professional contract. In 1884, the Brooklyn Grays joined the major leagues, and Terry became the first starting pitcher in Dodgers history and was a workhorse on their staff. He would throw two no-hitters and in 1889 and 1890 led Brooklyn to league pennants. From there, Terry would play for the Baltimore Orioles, Connie Mack's Pittsburgh Pirates, and Cap Anson's Chicago Colts. In his 14 year major league career, Terry would win a total of 197 regular season games along with three World Series games. He pitched 367 complete games over 3,500 innings and striking out more than 1,500 batters. This was at a time when major league baseball was constantly making major rule changes, including the biggest change moving the pitching distance back five feet to its current 60 feet, six inches. This was devastating to many pitchers, but Terry adjusted well. He won over 140 games before the rule change and more than 50 after. For his entire career, he pitched from flat ground and not a mound. He was also a versatile player, often playing other positions, including the outfield, shortstop, first base, third base. Offensively, an excellent hitter with a .295 on-base percentage and 594 hits and is ranked second among pitchers in stolen bases with 106. For the 1897 and 98 seasons, former teammate Connie Mack, player manager and owner of the Milwaukee Western League franchise, signed Terry not only as an experienced pitcher, 
but for his ability to draw fans to the park. His record over two years in Milwaukee was 33-13 and 13 in a league that within two years would become the American League. Terry was a pioneer in off-season training, playing handball and bicycling. He also practiced clean living habits during an era when most players spent their income in alcohol and gambling. In 1892, the Brooklyn Eagle would say of Terry, he is strictly temperate in his habits, an earnest worker and a player to reflect credit on his club and the fraternity by his manly conduct on and off the field. In the early years of professional baseball, umpires frequently did not show up for games as they feared for their lives. So Major League Baseball appointed certain players as substitute umpires, and Terry was one of those players. His knowledge of the game and fair play made him an excellent choice. When his playing days were over, he became a Major League umpire for one season. Terry, 5 feet 11 inches tall, was known for his good looks, and in 1886 was labeled Adonis by a famous Chicago sports writer who wrote, Terry performed with the rare grace of an Adonis. The Brooklyn management took full advantage of this and made sure he was pitching on Ladies' Day, drawing flocks of women to the ballpark. Terry was also a world-class bowler. After retiring from baseball, he would open up a successful bowling alley in Milwaukee, play in many regional and national tournaments, and was a member of the executive committee of the American Bowling Congress. Sadly, in 1915, Terry would pass away of pneumonia at the young age of 50. Our next inductee is Ulysses Grant, not that Ulysses Grant, not the president of the United States back in the 1870s. This is Ulysses Frank Grant, better known as a standout athlete in the latter part of the 19th century. The Pittsfield native began his baseball career at the semi-pro level, playing for both teams in both Pittsfield, Massachusetts and Plattsburgh, New York. In 1886, Grant made the switch to the Eastern League as an infielder for a team based in Meriden, Connecticut, and that's when his career really took off. Later that year, Grant signed with the Buffalo Bisons of the International League and continued his success for the next few years. With the Bisons in 1887, Grant had an impressive season, hitting 353 with 11 home runs and 49 extra base hits and leading the Bisons with 40 stolen bases, including when he stole home twice in a single game. During this time, racial turmoil was around the game and growed within the league and the whole nation. And the Bisons seemed to be the only team to fight against the segregation of the league, most likely because of Grant's success with the team. In 1889, the International League became a white-only league forcing all organizations to ban their black athletes. Frank Grant continued his career as a very successful Negro League star before his career ended in 1903. As a middle infielder, Grant was known for his stellar fielding skills and was commonly referred to as the best fielder in the Negro League during this time. In addition to his success on the field, Grant was the first African-American player to play on the same team in an organized league for at least three years when he was with the Cuban Giants from 1891 to 1897. In 2006, the Committee on African American Baseball elected Frank Grant to the National Baseball Hall of Fame in Cooperstown, New York. With this induction, Grant became the earliest Negro League player to be inducted into the Hall of Fame. Frank Grant passed away at the age of 71 in New York City, where he retired after his baseball career. Inductee number three is Happy Jack Chesbro. At the same time that Frank Grant was starring in the Negro Leagues, our next inductee was making him a name for himself in the Major Leagues. Jack Chesbro, known to this day for his record-setting performance in the 1904 season. Chesbro holds the American League record for most wins in a season by a pitcher, 41. If you look back at the record books, there are pitchers with more recorded wins in one season before 1901, but many baseball historians have named the 1901 season as the beginning of the modern era of Major League Baseball. The right-hander also holds two other records that some view as unbreakable. During that historic 1904 season, Chesbro started an incredible 51 games and completed 48. That'll never be broken. The North Adams native got his start playing for a Sandlot baseball team in Houghtonville, a small village of the city. 
In 1894, Chesbro moved to Middletown, New York, where he became an attendant at the Middletown State Hospital, just so he could play on the hospital's team, the Asylums. It was there that Chesbro earned his nickname, Happy Jack, when an inmate commented on his constant pleasant demeanor. Just a year later, Chesbro began his professional career where he pitched for a total of six different clubs from 1895 to 1899. On July 7, 1899, Chesbro was sold by his minor league team, the Richmond Bluebirds, to the Pittsburgh Pirates, where he made his major league debut a few days later. Ches Chesbro contributed to the National League pennant wins for the Pirates in 1901 and 1902 after leading the league in shutouts and wins with a 28-6 record in 1902. At this time, the American League was trying to entice stars from the National League to jump leagues with bonuses to their salaries. Chesbro took advantage of that pay increase and joined the New York Highlanders for the 1903 season. He then spent the next seven years of his career with the Highlanders, who were the precursor to the Yankees. During that famous 1904 season, Chesbro won 14 straight games at one point and also set franchise records of 239 strikeouts, such remain in place until 2001. Offensively, Chesbro inspired manager Clark Griffith to teach a new play, now commonly known as the squeeze play, when he mistakenly took home while his teammate was bunting. After finishing the 1908 season with a 14 and 20 record, the Highlanders assigned Chesbro to their minor league affiliate, the Indianapolis Indians. After nine appearances in Indianapolis, Chesbro was traded to the Boston Red Sox to face the Highlanders in the season finale. After his one start with the Red Sox, he was returned to the Highlanders where his career ended when he refused to report to the minor leagues. After he was cut from the Highlanders, Chesbro returned to Western Massachusetts where he pitched for a local semi-pro team. He also filled on his time coaching for various teams, including the team at Massachusetts Agricultural College, also now known as UMass at Amherst. In 1946, Jack Chesbro was inducted into the Baseball Hall of Fame, but his induction has served as a point of controversy ever since. He was inducted by the Veterans Committee, and Chesbro was chosen due to that stellar performance in 1904, but many believe that this one season overshadowed his subpar performances in other years. It's also noted that his records may never be broken due to rules and regulation changes. Happy Jack Chesbro retired to the town of Conway, where he passed away in November of 1931. From the shores of Newport and Martha's Vineyard to the mountains of New Hampshire and Vermont, for more than a quarter century, the New England Collegiate Baseball League has been synonymous with summer. Set in picturesque local communities and international vacation hotspots, the New England League is woven into the fabric of our historic region, delivering America's best amateur wooden bat baseball to countless passionate fans. Our 13 teams represent all six New England states and recruit premier talent representing every major conference, several foreign countries, and over 150 colleges and universities. More than 75% of our rosters are comprised of players from Division I programs. And each year, approximately 100 of our current or former players are selected in Major League Baseball's amateur draft. Well, the competition's extremely good up here in the NECBL. Catching all these arms that we see being like on our team or just hitting off the guys like on other teams, it's just top-notch. It's all about the kids on the field, you know, not only winning games but developing ball players. And we're pretty proud we've got 12 guys to the majors and many more in the minors right now. So it's been a fun, fun run. Great evening, great baseball. See everybody in the community here. It's just a fun night. We've been coming for 16 years. The New England League is consistently ranked among the top summer collegiate baseball leagues in the country. More than 150 of our alumni have made it all the way to the big leagues. And one in four of our players will go on to compete at the professional level. As a building block on their path to success, we deliver the full package. A first-class player experience, hands-on fan interaction, meaningful community engagement, and the opportunity to play baseball in its purest form, set against the backdrop of a memorable summer in New England.
And I remember in middle school coming down here with my buddies, and during the game we would just chase foul balls the whole time. You know, we, this is where I started to get introduced to baseball and that kind of level that, that we play at. Back then it was just a dream, and now I'm making it a reality. Honestly, every single day I come to the ballpark, I feel like a big leader. If that's what I want to be, I got to start acting like it, and this is the perfect opportunity to do it in any CBL. Over the course of an action-packed two months, our players grow and develop on the field and off, living with host families and serving as big league heroes in our local communities as they barnstorm New England night in and night out against the best of the best. So close to their dream of playing professional baseball, they can almost touch it. Uh, 25 years, we've come a long way. About 27% of our rosters uh, are drafted and played professionally. And you never know when you're watching the next Steven Strasburg or the next uh, future major leaguer. There's a lot of uh, measurements for success. And we take a lot of pride in, in developing our players and giving back in the community. Summer Collegiate Baseball in New England cuts across every socioeconomic line. Uh, you know, you come to the ballpark and you're going to see families, you're going to see retirees, you're going to see children running around. The past 25 years in New England League, has been the common denominator that has brought our communities together. The game of baseball is about so much more than what happens between the white lines. And our philosophy places an overall emphasis on diversity, civic engagement, and social impact. We believe the lives of every single one of our players, staff, volunteers, and the communities and fans which set the New England League apart are enriched and ennobled by America's game each summer. Ours is a tradition more than 25 years in the making, and one that will carry on for generations to come. We'll see you at the ballpark. Welcome back, and our next inductee was a local legend and a superhero when it comes to youth sports. Romeo Sear devoted his life to ensuring kids in the greater Springfield area had the opportunity to play organized sports. In 1950, he noticed that there were no playing opportunities for younger kids who were interested in baseball. Springfield and surrounding towns already had silent leagues for children ages 10 to 16, but there were no teams for the younger age groups. Sear was determined to fill this void. In May of 1950, he formed the John L. Sullivan Pee Wee League, named after a local youth sports legend. The league was comprised of 10 teams from Springfield, La Meadow, Chicopee, and Holyoke for kids ages 8 to 10 years old. Sear quickly saw how successful and well-received the Pee Wee League was, and he decided to add additional teams for younger age groups. Three leagues were added, including the Small Fry, Mighty Might, and Midget Leagues. Since their inception in the 1950s, these leagues have grown immensely, providing playing opportunities for hundreds of local children and helping to share the love of baseball with future generations. Of course, Romeo Sear was also well known in the regional hockey community. Sear was an active coach in the Eddie Shore Junior Hockey League and even was a general manager of the Springfield Flyers, an amateur team in the Atlantic Hockey League. He had a notable run after assembling an all-star team of 14 to 16 year olds from the Coliseum Junior League with Baldy Lee, then a Springfield College student, who would later become the superintendent of parks in Springfield. The duo won the New England Championship 3-2 in overtime in 1952. Sears' dedication and success in hockey did not go unrecognized by the city of Springfield. In March of 1973, the Springfield Parks and Rec Department named the new arena in downtown Springfield after a man who devoted much of his time to organizing youth sports in his hometown. Sear also contributed to youth basketball programs by creating the Catholic Junior Basketball League and expanded the John L. Sullivan Football League by adding another division for players 10 to 16 years old. Romeo Sears' involvement didn't stop with the individual sports leagues. Later on in life, he served as the chairman of the Springfield Parks Commission and continued his tradition of serving his community. All of Sears' work throughout that entire time was done on his free time, believe it or not. Romeo Sear passed away in May of 1993 at the age of 84. Our next inductee is a right-handed pitcher, Stu Miller, who was a Northampton native born back in 1927. Miller played for five different major league teams over his 16-season career, including the St. Louis Cardinals, the Philadelphia Phillies, the New York and later San Francisco Giants, the Baltimore Orioles, and the Atlanta Braves. Miller began his career in August of 1952, and when it ended in April of 1968 with the Braves, he had a record of 105 wins and 103 losses and a career earned run average of 3.24. He also had 154 saves. He was nicknamed the Butterfly Man 
for uh, his ability to fool a hitter with the slow speed of his curveball. Miller's fastball averaged just around 80 miles per hour, so he heavily relied on the off-speed pitch, which differed by about 8 miles per hour. He noted the secret to his success was the deception and the fact that both pitches look practically the same. Miller contributed to the Baltimore Orioles World Series win over the Dodgers in 1966. And one of the things he is most known for is his appearance in both All-Star games that took place back in 1961. The first game of the All-Star Series, wind wreaked havoc with the game and the players on the field and in the ninth inning, one of which was Miller. It is said that a strong gust of wind pushed Miller off the mound at Candlestick Park, resulting in a balk which then started a chain reaction of events which caused the National League to lose their lead. But he recovered in the 10th inning and was eventually named the winning pitcher of the game. Miller, along with Steve Barber, pitched a combined no-hitter on April 30th, 1967. And later that season, on May 14th, you may have seen this video before, Miller gave up Mickey Mantle's 500th career home run at Yankee Stadium. After his impressive tenure in the majors, Miller was inducted into the Baltimore Orioles Hall of Fame class of 1989, and he was a part of the inaugural class for the San Francisco Giants Wall of Fame in 2008 due to his six years spent as a Giant. Stu Miller was honored by the Northampton Recreation Department in 2015 with the dedication of Stu Miller Field, located at 90 West Street. Stu Miller passed away at the age of 87 in January of 2015. He is now a Western Mass Baseball Hall of Famer. Our last individual inductee is Springfield native Kevin Collins. He began his professional baseball career right after his successful high school career at Springfield Technical High School. He was signed by the New York Mets as an amateur free agent in January of 1964. The following season, Collins made his major league debut with the Mets in September. He would appear in 11 games during the 1965 season, either at third base or shortstop. At the tender age of 19, he was among the youngest players to appear in a major league game that season. For the 1966 season, he spent his time playing in the Mets minor league team in AA, the Williamsport Mets. He played 122 games that season where he batted 251 with eight home runs over 411 at bats, and his performance earned him Eastern League All-Star honors and a promotion to the Mets AAA affiliate, the Jacksonville Suns. During the 1967 season, he covered almost the entire infield, spending time at second and at third, as well as some time at shortstop. He appeared in 119 games before he was called up to the Mets and played in four games late that season. That September in the majors, Collins only had one hit and ten at bats. He began the 1968 season with Jacksonville, appearing in 28 games before he was called back to the Mets again as their third baseman. This time he played in 58 games and hit his first Major League home run that August. Collins continued to be at the Major League level at the beginning of the famous 1969 season before he was demoted to their AAA affiliate in Tidewater. The Mets then traded Collins on June of uh, 1969 to the Montreal Expos with three other players in exchange for Don Clendenin, who would go on to be the most viable player in the 1969 World Series. So unfortunately, Collins was traded from the Miracle Mets, but the Mets ended up getting one of the most important players in their run to the World Series in 69. Collins would go on to play 52 games with the Expos before he was sold to the Detroit Tigers at the end of the 1969 season. He appeared in only 60 games for the Tigers, mainly as a pinch hitter. While with the Tigers, he also made his debut at first base in the only game he played in the field during the 1970 season. After Collins was traded to the Cleveland Indians in June of 1973, he never played in another major league game and he retired from baseball in 1974. The Indians offered Collins an opportunity to remain with the organization for a coaching or scouting role, but he declined, ending his baseball career. Kevin Collins retired to Florida, where he passed away at the age of 69 in February of 2016. Well, obviously, the 2021 season is right around the corner, and a lot of kids here in Western Massachusetts are ready to play. Hey, Western Mass Baseball, this is Nick Ahmed coming to you from Arizona. I'm ready to play. We're ready to play! Go. We're ready to play. We're ready to play! I'm ready to play. We're ready to play. We're ready to play. I'm ready to play. 
I'm ready to play. One. I'm, I'm ready, ready to, to play. play. This is Pete Fatsy with the Boston Red Sox, and we're ready to play. Each year, in addition to the individual inductees, the Western Mass Baseball Hall of Fame Committee likes to spotlight a team that has furthered baseball throughout the region. And that's a tradition that started back in 2015 with the induction of the 1934 Springfield Pulse 21 team. That team, of course, made headlines when they forfeited a chance to play for a National American Legion title when they wouldn't play without their star player, a black player, Bunny Talaferro from Springfield. And this year, we continue that tradition by inducting the Hoyoke High School State Champions of 1950 and 1953. Of course, Hoyoke has a strong history as a great baseball town. The 1950 team, led by Joe Conway, ended their regular season undefeated. In the Western Mass Finals, the Knights had to uh, face the defending state champions from Pittsfield. And the Knights were down 4 to nothing when the game was rained down. That gave them a second chance. And Bo Brennan proved to be a key player in the Knights' 4-1 victory over Pittsfield in the rain makeup. Hoyoke would then go on to the state final to beat Somerville High School in a 10-0 shutout led by the pitching of Brennan and teammate Ron Lesser. The team's second baseman, Eddie Hurley, hit 474 in tournament play and stole home twice in the state final. In that game alone, the Knights stole nine bases, including three steals of home. The Knights concluded this season with an 16-0 record. The rest of the postseason lineup included Steve Kuzniers in center field, Dave Morrison at third, Hurley at second, Bruce Bauer at first, Bill Contrini in left field, Tom O'Connor at shortstop, Ron Kraus in right field, Don Graff catching, and Ron Lesser as a pitching alternate. Three years later, Hoyoke High had a brand new coach and a new lineup, but another championship season. They were led by Ed Muna Moriarty, a former big leaguer, and the Knights finished the season with a 22-2 record. Hoyoke's tournament run almost came to an end in the semifinals against Cathedral, but they advanced thanks to a home run by Frank Leisure, who would go on to become a New York Yankee. Similar to 1950, Hoyoke played Pittsfield in the Western Mass Final, and Pittsfield came into the game with an 18-0 record, but would receive their first loss of the season. Hoyoke pitcher Roger Marquis would outlast Pittsfield's two aces, and the Knights win it 3-2, and that would put them in the state final where they faced Milford High School. Milford's team was stacked with players who had reached the 1952 American Legion World Series, including Ralph Lamente, who would go on to pitch for UMass, and then later the Washington Senators. This star-studded team was no match for Hoyoke shortstop and team captain Ron LaMontagne, whose three-run double in the fifth inning erased a 4-3 Milford lead and brought the team to their 7-4 victory. The remaining lineup included John McGinty leading off and playing second base, followed by Woods in center field, LaMontagne at short, Leisure at first, Marquis pitching, George McGarity in left field, Bill Skinner at third, Andy Quirk in right, and Vinny Cousineau doing the catching. Congratulations to the 1950 and 1953 Hoyoke Purple Knights, state champions, and now Western Mass Baseball Hall of Famers. At the 2020 Hall of Fame Banquet, the first inaugural Ryan Doyle Courage Award was posthumously presented to Ryan Doyle for his extremely high character and remarkable courage facing adversity. This year, the Hall of Fame is proud to carry on that tradition and award in Ryan's name and the second presentation of the Ryan Doyle Courage Award. The 2021 recipient is Trey Mancini, who has enjoyed a very successful baseball career, now stars for the Baltimore Orioles. He played his collegiate ball at Notre Dame and spent his 2011 summer in Western Massachusetts with the Hoyoke Blue Sox. Trey was drafted by the Baltimore Orioles in the eighth round of the 2013 Major League Draft, and he made his debut in 2016. He has been a mainstay with the O's from 2017 to 2019, where he hit 83 home runs and drove in 233 runs over three seasons. In March, though, of 2020, he was diagnosed with stage 3 colon cancer. He underwent six months of intensive chemotherapy treatments before being declared cancer-free. After his battle with cancer, Trey went on to form the Trey Mancini Foundation. The mission is to support those who are facing illness, empower those suffering from emotional trauma, and provide assistance to those experiencing hardship. At this time, we turn the program over to Ryan Doyle's parents, Tim and Dee, who will be presenting Trey Mancini with the Ryan Doyle Courage Award. 
Okay, I have just a little something prepared. Um, when Mike Trombley emailed us to let us know they would be giving the Ryan Doyle Courage Award again this year, we were thankful for allowing us to be the ones to be able to present it to you, Trey. And be able to be able to honor Ryan by telling his story. Um, we'd like to thank Mike Trombley, the Hall of Fame Committee, the Blue Sox, Frank and Chris Wyant, and Steve Lucas and Don LeWare. Um, courage, the definition is the, the ability to do something that frightens one or strength in the face of adversity or pain. Ryan is the example of this definition. When thinking of Ryan's battle, I think of strength. During Ryan's three-year battle with osteosarcoma, a rare cancer usually found in young adults and children, strength automatically comes to mind. Going through countless rounds of chemotherapy and at least seven operations, never once did Ryan waver. His ability to stay positive is contagious and many times Ryan would be the one supporting family members and friends with a positive attitude and an ever present smile. I think this is Ryan's way of putting us at ease, always concerned about how we felt instead of what he was dealing with. To me, this is a big characteristic of strength, being concerned about others rather than feeling bad about his situation. Even when he was in the hospital, he carried this attitude. Like the time two days after having his leg amputated above the knee and lung surgery, Ryan had some red and blue clay he was given to by the child life specialist, and he rolled it up to look like fibers or veins and tucked it in his bandage. The doctor came in and asked Ryan how he was doing, and Ryan said, I don't know, is it supposed to look like this? <laughs> the doctor jumped back, startled, and we all got a laugh. Um, Ryan also found a way to keep himself involved in school, trying to keep as much normalcy as possible. One time a week after another double lung surgery, Ryan taped pillows to his crutches and went with his class on a field trip. Well, on the field trip, one of the obstacles the kids encountered was a swaying footbridge. Ryan had just received a new prosthetic leg and was able to navigate the bridge on his new leg. Tough enough with two good legs, never mind with a prosthetic. Sharing funny stories always helps lighten the mood, but the fact is, for three years, Ryan battled. These are only a few of the many moments of courage and strength during Ryan's battle. So being able to present this award to Trey is an honor. Mm -hmm. We have read your story, Trey, and it is our pleasure to be able to give you this award to such a deserving young man. You understand the battle, and we wish you nothing but the best during your journey through life. Why, on your journey, may you carry Ryan's spirit and determination with you. Oh, sure. So on behalf of the Western Massachusetts Baseball Hall of Fame, we are honored to present you with the Ryan Doyle Courage Award. There it is. <laughs> wow. Wow. I, I really don't even know what to say. Um, I'm so humbled and, and honored to be receiving this award. Um, you know, I've, I've been reading a lot about Ryan's story and his battle, and um, he's the epitome of a fighter and, and a warrior. And, um, you know, I wish that I could say that I was a strong last year as he was um, for the three years that he was battling, but I, I, really can't honestly say that. I, I truly am amazed. And, um, you know, I don't even know if, if I can say that I'm deserving of the award, but I will humbly accept it. Um, I um, will forever cherish this. And it, it truly is one of the great honors of my life receiving this award. Um, it, it, I, I have goosebumps right now. And, and um, again, just thank you so much. And, and thank you for thinking of me. And um, I, I loved my time in Western Mass. So now, um, you know, having this tie to it too makes it extra special for me. Great. Thank, Thank you. Guys. Thank you. Thank you. I wish you nothing but the best. Yeah. Right. Yeah. You, you too. <clears throat> Trey, if I could really quick, um, could you give us just a few details about the foundation that you just started up and, and what you're doing um, now following your, your battle with cancer? Yeah. So, um, for a few years now, I've been wanting to do a foundation. So um, my sister and I just about had it ready before my diagnosis and before COVID. So um, originally, it was going to be a backpack program for students in Baltimore. Um, a lot of the students there go hungry during the days. Um, 
So that was the initial plan. And that's still really what we're, um, you know, we're definitely not going to neglect that. So we're going to partner with Blessings in a Backpack and support a lot of um, kids in the area through that. But we're also going to focus on, you know, cancer too, um, especially after my battle and, and any stories that really resonate with me. Um, you know, we've, we've partnered with the Colorectal Cancer Alliance. Um, you know, I'm, I'm sure there's some foundations and, and things for osteosarcoma, and I would love to be involved in that. So basically anything that's near and dear to our heart, we're going to get behind and, and try to support with different events and, and things like that. Yeah, well, we started, we started the RD26 Foundation shortly after Ryan passed away, and it's right. to help, help kids with cancer. Yep. And that's, yeah, that's exactly the, the kind of things that um, we're looking to, to support. So, um, you know, at, at some point this year, sometime soon, um, I would love to, you know, reach out to you guys if possible and maybe um, do an event to, to benefit, yeah, the RD26 yeah, company. Yeah. We can, we can save you a foursome in the golf tournament. <laughs> oh, yeah. That's only problem. I got I, I to practice my golf game because it's not good. It sold out in one day last year. We had oh, a- yeah, yeah, I would, yeah, just uh, that, that's the epitome of, of what we're trying to get behind. Yeah. Well, we'd like to be involved too with your foundation. If there's Absolutely. anything we can do, I mean, I, I mean, it's perfect. I mean, yeah, it is. Yeah. Cause we're, yeah, we're not just colon cancer. It is, it is anything. Um, I, I, yeah, I, um, lost one of my college teammates last year to, to um, glioblastoma. So, um, you know, I might do, do something or whatever his family is, is passionate about. We're going to do an event with him and, um, you know, just, just anything that, that resonates with me and everything, anything that we see, we, we'd love to, to help out. So this is perfect. Same. Yeah. We're, we're doing it. It's for children with, with cancer and their families. Like if their families are having trouble, we're, we're trying to like maybe give them a week's worth of groceries or whatever they want to do. Give them money so they can put, stay in a hotel. That's little amazing. things like that. It's not yeah, little things that people don't really think of every day, you know, yeah. everyday expenses. Yeah, 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 yeah that's amazing. Kind of kept it underground, reaching out from people that we know and um, not giving, you know, big donations to centers per se. We're giving it directly to, to families. The people. Yeah. That's amazing. Yeah. I love that. Wow. But but listen, Trey, one of the things I used to tell my kids, I've been a coach for a long time. I've been coaching baseball for 30 something years. And one of the things I used to tell my kids, okay, was when they got up to the plate was smash the ball. Smash. Yep, that's it. And, and I love the way you hit the ball. <laughs> I, and, 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 and that's, that's like, you, you're like the that's epitome it. of the, of the guy that I would love to coach. You know what <laughs> I mean? I, I can't be, if I'm thinking of, of anything else besides smashing the ball, I'm done. That's it. I have to be thinking one thing. You, yeah, baseball. You can't be thinking too much. And yeah, I love that. So tomorrow during my game, I'm. I was thinking a little too much yesterday, so I'm going to go more with that approach tomorrow. I think. <laughs> nice, yeah. nice. Yeah. yeah. Congratulations on being Thank back. You. Yeah. Nice to see you got your head out of the way. Get the, get the uh, monkey. Yeah. Off. Yeah. So yeah, I got out of the way. So that's a monkey off the back there. So um. So yeah, I felt good. Awesome. Awesome. Congratulations to Trey Mancini and all of our inductees. Now let's meet the 2021 Valley Blue Sox.
Hey Blue Sox Nation, John Rayola here, Director of Baseball Operations. Just wanted to take a couple minutes and talk to you about some things that you can look forward to this summer down at the MAC. So first and foremost, we have switched divisions. We are heading to the South, which I think will be a really cool thing for our guys and for you, the fans, to be able to see some new teams that we haven't really seen very much of in the past. Ocean State, Danbury, Mystic, uh, Newport for sure. Some teams that have had some really good years uh, over the last you know, few seasons and, and teams that we've certainly run into and had some good battles with. So we'll have an opportunity to play them a little bit more often. You'll have an opportunity to see them. And then on the field, you can expect to see a lot of the same programs that have been represented uh, with us over the years. Xavier, Marist, Yale, Belmont, uh, Monmouth, Richmond, Moorhead State. Uh, a lot of programs that have sent us really, really talented players over the years. They've continued to, uh, to kind of keep that pipeline going and send us some of their best this year. Guys that are off to really, really good starts. And uh, we're certainly looking forward to, uh, to seeing in a Blue Sox uniform. Also, we've got a few new programs represented. Washington, Butler, Davidson, Charleston Southern, Manhattan. Um, sending us equally as, as talented players and, and teams that are off to good starts in their own right. So you know, we're really excited to be able to, uh, to get everybody here and um, kind of continue some of the momentum that we've had over the last few years. So we're certainly excited and we can't wait to see you at the MAC. So uh, it'll, it's right around the corner and we're looking forward to it. So we'll see you soon and go Blue Sox. We are definitely looking forward to an exciting season. We would like to thank Westfield Bank for their continued support of this event and Hoyoke Media for their efforts and talent in producing this video presentation. If you'd like to learn more about the Hall of Fame or the Blue Sox organization, please visit valleybluesox.com. From myself and the Western Massachusetts Baseball Committee, we would like to thank you for taking the time to watch this video and celebrate the induction class of 2021. Thanks for joining us, and hopefully, let's play ball soon. See ya.